Welcome to volume one of The Woods Master, where we teach you to be the Woods Master. In this volume of The Woods Master, we're going to be talking about spark based fire making. Now, what is spark based fire making? Well, it's starting a fire with anything that starts a spark. And we're not talking about sparks that come from blue diamond matches here. We're talking about sparks that start with things like flint and steel, uh, the metal match, uh, the fire bow, and other techniques. Now, you're going to notice in this volume of The Woods Master that things are going to change from time to time probably most notably me. You see when we started this volume of the Woods Master it was back about four years ago and since then we've been in the constant process of improving and adding more information to our videos. So you're gonna see a new me adding more information to the old video. So don't be disturbed when you see things change. Well I think it's about time that we got started with spark based fire making. All the stuff that you see around me here is called willow. Willow is one of the most common plants in the world. You'll find it just about everywhere. And as you may have noticed, it tends to grow in canyons. It's usually down in the drainage areas where there's a lot of water. Willow is also one of the most useful plants we can have, at least for survival purposes. You'll discover that with willow we can make fire bows, we can make the drills, we can make the, the base plate where we're going to start the fire. Uh, you can also make bows and arrows. And uh, believe it or not, the bark on the thing is a source of uh, a chemical that a lot of us take. It's called uh, aspirin. At least it was one of the original sources. So let's take a little closer look at it and begin to understand exactly how this is going to figure into our fire making. As you can see behind me, this willow can grow to be quite large. Now this one here is just about right for what we're trying to do. What you'll learn is when you're looking for willow for straight sticks, if you're trying to make arrows or you're trying to make fire bows or walking sticks or whatever it is you want it for, you need to get to the center of the largest, densest cluster you could find. That's where you're going to discover the branches will grow tall, straight, and smooth with very few knots or little branches growing off to the side. In addition to that, You'll see that the bugs don't tend to get in there as much. I don't know why, maybe it's too tight for them. But whatever it is, let's get in there and get us some willow because we've got to make a fire. Now the question is, what's ideal for the fire bow? And remember, the fire bow is the part that you're going to have in your hand moving back and forth. Well, that's up to you. If you're really strong, you can move a big piece of wood. But I suggest, since you'll be doing it a lot, that you get something that's strong, but about the size of maybe your thumb or your, your point and finger. This one here is about right. So we're just going to harvest this one and then we're going to look for some more. A little something about these big old hackers here. When you're using one of these things, you never want to cut towards yourself. That should be obvious. But towards yourself means towards your leg as well. So when you're doing a, a cut with one of these, always go 
with gravity, so you're cutting downwards, and cut to the side of your body. So try to hold the stick as vertically as you can and cut like that. And then you'll be able to clear the end nicely, and if you drop the knife, it won't go in your leg. That's helpful. You know, a lot of people buy these big old choppers like this, and there's a lot of value to having a knife of this type. But when you get into this tight kind of uh, brushy stuff, it's a little hard to swing. And it's possible if you were to swing in here, you could glance off a branch and end up stabbing yourself. So let me make a recommendation. Don't use these as your primary survival knife. Instead, what you want to think about is something more like this. This is a Swiss Army knife with just a couple of blades on it. But you notice it's got a nice long saw blade. And these little saw blades here will allow you to cut things even in the closest of quarters. And it makes a nice clean cut. The other little blade here is real handy for doing things like whittling, which you're going to be seeing a lot of here shortly. If I had only one knife to take out on a survival trip, it would be this knife here, my Swiss Army knife. A little plug for Swiss Army, huh? Let's get started here. While I was in there in the middle of that willow thicket, cutting off my little piece of wood, I spotted this puppy here. This is also a piece of willow, but it's dead. It's been in there for a long time, and as you can probably see, the portion where my hand is is nice and straight. This is an ideal piece of wood for the fire drill. This will be the part that will be spinning to create friction. So I picked that while I was in there. Also while I was in there, I spotted this thing. This is another piece of willow that was broken off and dead from long ago. This is a great piece of wood that we can use for the fire board. That's the base, the very bottom of the fire set. This is where the fire is going to get started. It'll be the friction between the drill and the board that creates your fire. So when you're in these things, keep your eyes open. It's a good spot to find just about everything you need to build your fire. A little something else about, uh, about cutting and about willow that you ought to know. This bark here contains um, something that's related to aspirin. And if you were to take this and just peel off a little bit of this stuff, inside here is a whitish bark. You'd probably be able to notice that there's a, a lighter color. The dark outer parts you can eat as well. Neither of them will hurt you. But it's the inner parts that have that medicinal quality. So you can just chew it up and, you know, tastes just like aspirin. Not pleasant. There's another little thing that you ought to know about. When you're trimming these willows, particularly these nice long straight stretches you're going to have for your fire bow, you kind of want to try to cut from the thicker portion of the willow to the thinner portion of the willow. And it of course means that you have to cut away from yourself. So you simply trim towards the, the smaller end, like this. And the bark will peel right off, just like you see here. Now this bark, as you peel it off, you can keep this for other uses. You can make things like um, baskets or sandals or even rope when we get around to teaching you how to do that. But for the moment what you want to do is that fire bow of yours needs to be stripped of its bark. When you strip the bark off like this it cuts the weight quite a bit and the willow will tend to dry just a little bit faster. And it's that dry willow that's nice and springy and keeps the tension on the string that's going to be in your fire bow. So go ahead and strip that bark off. Just like this. Yeah. While we're out here walking around, I happen to notice that there's a nice looking juniper tree over here. Well, we're gathering materials to make a fire, and this juniper tree has bark, and that bark is flammable. So let's take a look at it, and I'm going to show you some little tricks with juniper bark that'll make it a lot easier for you to get that fire started. Come on. This here is that juniper tree we were talking about. Now you notice on this thing there's some pretty loose bark. You can peel this stuff right off. And that's one of the characteristics of the tree that makes it so valuable. One of the other characteristics is the fact that this bark is very flammable. If you were to peel this stuff off as I'm doing here and then rub it up a bit, and you'll see that, 
you'd be able to turn it into a real fine fiber that you can use to start a fire. We're going to gather a little of this stuff and get ready. Now you might notice that these come off in long stretches, something like this. The Indians up here used to gather this stuff, tear it up like you see, soak it in water, and then weave it into a kind of rope. Now you'll learn more about rope in another, in another issue of our video magazine. But for the moment, all you need to know is you can make it into rope and they would turn that into things like mats and blankets and sometimes even moccasins. Well, at least a bottom for a pair of sandals. So let's get back to camp and get to work on our fire making stuff. Here's a little tip I wanted to show you. Something about how do you cut a piece of wood. Check this out. Take the knife and hold it to the sharp edge up, something like you see right here. And bring the wood down on top of it. Put your thumb on top. Now what you're going to do is rotate the piece of wood on top of the blade. When you do this, don't rotate the wood away from your thumb, or your thumb will drop down onto the blade and cause a nasty cut. Try to avoid that. So just put it right up underneath your thumb, put pressure on it with your thumb, and roll the wood towards your thumb. So it's trying to climb right into your hand. Now if you do this right, you're going to get a lot of pressure, and each time you rotate that piece of wood, it's going to dig just a little deeper in there. That blade's going in. Then you take the wood and snap it. And you can see you get a nice clean edge. All you got to do is work that down a bit, and you'll be fine. The fire bow assembly is made of five different pieces. There's the fire bow, the string, the drill, this is what makes fire, the fire board or base, this is where the fire will start with friction between the drill and the base, and the bearing. The bearing fits in your hand so you don't start a fire in your fist. So those are the five pieces and we're going to get this stuff together. This is the piece I've selected to use as our, our bow, and this will be the piece that we'll be attaching the cord to. Now you've already seen how you strip some of that bark off, and we're going to go ahead and do that to this piece of wood. But before I do, I want you to notice that one end of it has a little fork on it. I've chosen this piece because it has the fork on one end, that's the thin end, and secondly, it has a slight arch to it. You see, it's a little bit of a curvature. That'll help to keep the drill away from my hand when I'm working the bow back and forth. So we'll just get started on this guy and make her up. As you can see, I've gone ahead and taken all the bark off the outside of this piece of wood, and it's quite a bit cleaner now. It's also a lot lighter. That bark I cut off reduced the weight of the stick by maybe 20%. It's odd, but there's a lot of water in that, in that bark. But I still want to make it a little bit cleaner so it's smoother to the hand and looks a little bit nicer. So let's take a look at another trick and that'll be how you can hold your blade to do some smoothing on a piece of wood like this. Ordinarily when you're shaving the wood you're running the blade along the wood this way. But if you take the blade and hold it straight up and down to the piece of wood and then scrape you'll find that it acts a little bit like a piece of sandpaper and you can see all the wood will peel off in little curly segments just like that. That takes all the last little bits of bark off and gives you a nice smooth finish on your wood. After all, you don't want to be a sloppy fire bow guy. So go ahead and do this to your entire uh, stick and make it nice and smooth. And then we'll get on to the next part. That's cutting the notches for the string. The cord for the fire bow can be made out of a lot of different things. People have used uh, shoelaces, they've used strips of leather taken from their belt, uh, they've used rawhide. Uh, you can even manufacture cordage out of natural materials and make a fire bow. But for today, what we're going to use is parachute cord. Now you can buy this stuff at any surplus store. It's fairly inexpensive. 
and the, each one of these strands, each one of these cords will hold about 500 pounds, actually a little bit more than that. But what's really important about this particular kind of cord is its special qualities. Among those qualities are the cord itself is comprised of an outer sheath which has inside of it a number of inner lines. Now these inner lines each are, are very very strong. I don't know what each one of them will hold but it'll hold plenty and you could use them for things like snares or bowstrings if you want or well anything you need a thin piece of cord for and you still have a lot of cord left. Each one of those smaller strings, these here, can be, then be broken down into smaller strings yet something like threads. Those threads can be used for sewing, you could use them as fishing line, or anything you need a piece of thread for. So what we've got is a nice piece of cord with a lot of uses. And for survival purposes, that's what you want to do. You want to have a lot of uses for everything that you have. Okay, I've taken that uh, parachute cord and tied a little loop in the end. What I want to do now is put the loop over one of the forks on the piece of wood that we prepared and stretch it out down the length of the bow. You can see if I hold it just like this it makes a nice little space between the string and the piece of wood and that's what you want because you don't want your your drill actually contacting the bow itself. If I put the the notch at the bottom which will hold the string in this position if I put that in the wrong place what would happen then is that string might be laying right up against the wood. We don't want that. So now I know this is about how I want it and I want the back of the notch to be behind where the cord is, about where my thumb is. So I'm going to cut a little notch right there. This is, my thumb is in the position that I've already marked when I was checking out the arch on the bow. So I'm going to take my happy dandy little uh, saw blades on the Swiss Army knife and cut in a little bit. That cut is going to be the bottom of the notch to hold the string. Now if you look at it, you can see that it's cut in a little bit at an angle. The angle is kind of pointed towards the, the tip of the stick. So we'll cut that in a little bit like so. Not too far. You don't want the stick to break off. Once you've cut that notch in there, then you could switch over to another blade. So now I've got my regular blade out here. And I'll just cut off some of the excess wood behind the notch. Okay. Now what we want to do is check to see if that notch will hold. So I'm going to slip a piece of the wood of the, sorry, of the cord right over the top and looky there. That notch will hold that cord nice and tight. So now we have both ends of the fire bow ready to go. Okay, we've got ourselves a little bow now. What I want to do now is take the string, put it over the little fork we have on one end, run it up to the notch that we cut just a few moments ago, and I'm going to pull on this to get the string nice and tight. Now you can see that the bow is beginning to arch a little bit here. We want it to be arched just like this as it dries. We want to get a little bit of a arch burned into it. So what I'm going to do is tie it off with this string and uh, let it sit while we go through the preparation of the rest of it. It's good and tight. You probably notice as uh, as your bow dries, the string will start to stretch. Well, I'm going to show you a little trick about stretching string in just a minute. If we were to try to use this bow just as it is with this string on here, you're going to find you have a lot of problems. It's not going to actually turn the drill very well. That's because the string is really smooth. The next thing is we need to make a string that's not smooth, that will actually engage the drill. So let me show you how that part's done. I've taken a piece of that parachute cord and I've tied a little loop right in the middle of the cord so I can hook it over my walking stick as you see here. Now I have two strands of the parachute cord tied to a little piece of wood that I call a toggle, one on each side. 
Now what we're going to do is we're going to turn the toggle between my fingers in a clockwise direction in that manner. Once I've turned it a few times, I'll pick it up and lift it over the top of the other toggle and its string. Now I take the second one and I turn it in a clockwise direction. And after I've turned it a few times, I lift it up and put it over the top of the first one. And I keep on doing that, just lifting over the top of the other string and turning each of the toggles in a clockwise direction until I finished making my rope. And you can see as it goes along here, it begins to resemble regular old rope. In fact, that's what it is. It's regular old rope. This gives you that nice bumpy cord that you need to engage the fire drill. Have fun. When you see those toggles in action, you might think, gosh, making rope is going to be a pretty slow process. But the fact of the matter is, it's very fast once you know the trick. Let me show you something. I made all this fire making rope out of a piece of parachute cord in just a minute and a half using a slightly different technique. Same principle, just a different way of handling the rope. Let me show you how that's done. Okay, what I've got here is a little bit of the rope I've already made. Just slide your finger up to the last little junction, the last twist, and hold it with your thumb and forefinger. Now take the rope and twist it away from yourself like that, bring it over the top, and then grab the other rope. Twist it away from yourself and bring it over the top, something like this. Now you can see all I'm doing is I'm twisting away from myself and bringing it over. And looky here, if I put it between my thumb and forefinger and roll it, it puts a little twist on it. Then I can take my other finger, grip it, rotate my wrist, and that puts a new piece of fiber in the right position. So the motion, once you learn this, is this way. Twist, grab, twist, grab, twist, grab, and like that. It goes a lot faster once you start making rope in this way. And you could do this with just about any kind of fiber. You'll see a lot more of that in another edition. Have fun with your rope making. Okay, I went ahead and cut um, about four of these drills. I've got three of them here and another one drying. From those pieces of dead wood, I gathered in the middle of the, the willow stand. Now, some of these things aren't exactly straight. You're going to find that you want them as straight as possible when you're working. If they've got any kind of a wobble at all, it's going to make it very difficult for you to spin that drill um, accurately. The thing's going to want to walk all over everything. So, be sure that they're straight. Now, this one here is fairly straight. It's also kind of short. But that's up to you. Uh, when we start in on this thing, you're going to discover that you'll have to find your own length for drill. Some people like them long, some people like them a little bit shorter. Some people find that if it's only a, about a six inch drill, they could control it a lot more easily than they can a great big long one like this. But whatever you do, you'll discover that if it's about thumb diameter, it'll be just about right. Okay, now that we've got a, a drill selected, the first thing you want to do is sharpen the tip of the drill, just like this. You're want, going to want to do this to both ends. Both ends should have a nice, sharp point when you're finished. Now that we have both ends sharpened, we're going to take the next step, and that is to flatten the sides of the stick. What we want to do is create some facets, some little gears, or so to speak, on the, on the sides of the stick, and this will engage the string. So as you can see, what I'm doing is basically just cutting the bark off, like so. Like that. Now you want to do this up the entire length of the drill. But you'll see here that this portion, the shaft of the drill, is almost square now. And that's where that cord is going to wrap. It's going to wrap right around this thing, engage it tight, and it's not going to allow that drill to do anything but turn. Well, now we have our finished bow, our knobby string, and our drill. So let's put them together. The way I do it is I just push that drill in between the bow and the string, wrap it around a little bit, and then just lift the back end of the drill, like so. Now you can see it's way up here. If you want it down a little farther, 
just roll the drill till you get it where you want it to be. But you can see that this string is engaging that drill nice and tight, and that's not going to slip. So we're ready. Now we can move on to making the base, and I'll show you how to make a nice bearing to make the whole thing turn. Okay, this here's that, um, that piece of wood we found out there. And what I did is I broke it off to about six, eight inches in length, and I split it in half right along a natural seam in the wood. Now what we do to, to prepare the fire base, and this is where the fire is going to actually get started, so we take the tip of our knife and we find a spot eh, maybe halfway through the stick in this case. We'll just take the tip of your knife, drill a little hole. It doesn't have to go in very far. Basically all it is is a socket. Let me show you what I mean by that. You've got your drill, and the drill has a point on it. What we're going to do is put the assembly together. That's the fire bow, the string, and the drill, and we're going to put that together just in this way. You can see the little point fits right in that little hole. And we're going to spin it back and forth. And what will happen is it will dull the drill, and it'll burn a hole right in the wood here and create a bunch of nice tinder. After we've made that little hole right in here burned by the drill, I'm going to cut a little notch with the saw on my knife so that any of the flammable pieces that might develop will fall off the edge. And we'll get our fire started. So you've got your fire drill. And you know one of these tips is nice and sharp. That sharp end is going to have to sit on some kind of a bearing. That, that bearing allows this drill to spin as fast as possible with as little friction as possible. And it also means that you're going to need something nice and hard to rotate on. Well, there's lots of materials in nature that you can use for that. Let me, let me show you a couple of them. This here is a piece of antler. And I just took my knife and hollowed out a little spot in it right there so it'll engage the tip of the drill, something like this. And that allows this drill to spin really fast. It's handy too because you can put your hand on it like that and control the drill when you're spinning. Another nice thing about using an antler is the tips of these antlers up in here are useful for making other kinds of tools like stone tools in a thing called pressure flaking. So if you can find one of these, you got yourself an excellent fire making bearing. Another alternative is a piece of rock. I found this little stream stone laying down there and I simply chipped at it with another stone until I created a small depression. Later on, just by using my fire drill, I was able to spin that back and forth in that depression and it rounded it out nicely. It just sort of ground a little hole in there. And I might add too that it's important to try to lubricate the bearing every once in a while and you can get lubrication from places like your face. A little oil from around the sides of your nose or, or any other kind of oil, suntan lotion and so forth. Put a little of that in that little depression and that'll help it to spin faster too. One more alternative that you can often find is something like this. This is just a piece of bone. This is actually a vertebrae from some animal I found up here. And while this one is kind of old, uh, it'll still do the job. Again, I took my knife and hollowed out a little spot, and this is where the point of the drill is going to rotate. And these are handy. If you find a fresh one, they're good and hard, and they're easy to hold. You can hold them something like this. It gives you good control over that drill. But look around. There's lots of different things you could use for that bearing surface out here in nature. Keep your eyes open. You can never tell what you'll find. There's another alternative you might want to try. And that's this little puppy here. <laughs> a lot of people have these in their house. This is a shot glass. And when you're practicing with a fire bow, a shot glass makes one heck of a nice bearing. Now, you might notice that this has been taped up with duct tape. Don't use scotch tape or anything like that, but do tape it. These things can break while you're using them, and if they break, it'll drive glass right up into your hand. So tape them up real well and make sure that if it does break, it won't come apart in your hand. These really rotate and make a nice cup for while you're practicing and learning how to use the fire drill assembly. Later on, you can try things like bone and stone and so forth. Other alternatives you might find out in the wilderness are bottle caps, shotgun shell bases, um, if you've got a hollow handled knife or something like that, you probably could use the cap for that. Just look around. Look for something hard, something with a little depression that'll act like a bearing. And you got the top. This here is your basic fire bow position. If you're staying in this position here, you can keep a lot of pressure on the drill and you can also keep the thing stable. 
it would be down something like this with the, the drill in that position, the bearing sitting on top of the drill, and the bow right here. Now you can see that I'm resting my forearm against my lower leg. That way I've got some stability and I can move this back and forth and the drill will spin nice and true. First thing we got to do now is we're going to burn a hole in that fire base. So let's give that one a shot. Well, here we go. Now, this little part here is kind of tricky. Sometimes when you start, you'll find that the, the drill will um, jump right up out of the bow and fly around. So be sure there's nobody standing around you when they, you give this a shot. Let's give that in there. First, we just put the little point inside the hole we made with our knife. Put that bearing right up on top of the drill. Get a spot. Start moving back and forth. Now what we're doing as we do this is we're burning a little hole in the fire base. You may be able to see a little smoke coming out. Don't worry about getting the fire yet. It's not time. All we're doing is getting things put together. Now after you've done this for a while and you think you want to quit, just go ahead and quit. Now take a look at the end of that, that drill and you'll see that it's burnt. The whole tip of the drill is burnt. We've got a nice burnt hole down here in the fireboard. We now have a little uh, burned hole in our fire base. What I'm going to do now is make a notch right in this piece of wood. And that notch is where the coal is eventually going to form and drop down. If it drops out down into here, it's going to drop into a, a batch of tinder that we've already placed where it should be. So using my handy dandy Swiss Army knife, we cut a little notch. I'll point out that some books will show you cutting the notch first and then trying to make your fire. But you'll discover if you do it that way that the, the drill will just naturally fall into the notch and fall out. So if you do it the way I'm showing you here, I think you're going to have a lot of luck. Now one other little pointer that a lot of people don't know is if you're not getting enough friction down in this area, you could drop in one or two grains of sand. And then when you start working back and forth, you'll find that it creates an awful lot of friction and more of this uh, black burnt powder will fall out down the notch and that'll make it easier to start the fire too. You'll probably discover after a while that the tip of the drill is going to start to get shiny. Once it starts to do that, it loses its friction. So what you want to do is take your knife and just cut little facets. Like cut the tip off and cut little chunks out of your drill tip. That'll improve the friction a little bit and give you some new material to cut down into the crack in the wood there. You may need to do that a few times until you get the, the thing to burn properly. The other end of the drill will sometimes get a little dull, and that's not what you want there. You want as little friction as possible up in the portion where you're holding it. So there what you want to do is decrease friction by keeping the tip nice and sharp. Something like this. That way it'll spin freely at the top. There'll be lots and lots of friction at the bottom where you want it. And that'll keep the amount of energy that you put into this assembly to a minimum. Sometimes you'll discover that you'll find a favorite baseboard that always starts your fires. When that's the case, what you'll end up doing is just using it and using it and using it until it's got rows and rows and rows of holes in it. This one here I've been using for quite a while and it's always been a good board. It usually gets a fire started for me. Next what you need is that juniper we collected earlier. We peeled this off the tree as you know and it's been sitting out in the sun for a while to kind of drive off the last little bits of moisture. You also need your hat. Now whenever I do this I 
make sure that the outside of my hat is the part I work with. I don't want to be putting anything from a tree in the inside of my hat because it might have ticks in it or just about anything else. So I make a depression on the top of my hat. And you just take your, your juniper bark, fold it over a few times like this, and start crumpling it up. Now remember, this could be done with anything. A sagebrush will work. Um, it's a lot of different kinds of trees that have bark that'll peel off like this. And almost any of them are okay. You can also use things like cotton balls if you want to, just as a way of testing all of this at home. Now you notice that that clump is broken down now into a, a finer mixture. And all of these little pieces here, all of these little facets, will help to catch the fire when you get ready to do that. So I'm just going to go ahead and make some more of this until I get something that's uh, about the size of a bird's nest. And what I usually do is I do this is I tear the stuff apart and some of the bigger pieces I'll just set aside on the brim of my hat like this and those will become the edges of the bird's nest. After we've got this all prepared and we've got lots of really fine stuff, something like this, take these bigger pieces, put them in my hand like so, squeeze them a little bit, and kind of massage them into a shape that again looks a lot like that bird cage. That bird cage, bird's nest, you know, you all know what I'm talking about, it's a bird's nest. Then you take the stuff out of the top of your hat and put it right on top. So you've got the really fine stuff that fell to the bottom of your hat, fell in first, you lay that on top of the, the nest, and this is what you're going to be setting your fireboard on. This is what's going to catch the coal when you start working your drill back and forth. So give that a shot, because we're gonna. It went out. It went out. Fire. As you can probably tell, fire by friction is not the easiest way to start a fire. If you decide to learn fire by friction, I suggest that you start by getting the pieces just as I showed you and practice. Practice in your backyard and then practice some more. And keep on going until you get a good fire set and then carry that with you. Just building one out in the wilderness is kind of a problem. You're never sure you're going to get the right pieces. But once you do, it's a lot of fun to do and it does look pretty wonderful. And it gives you a sense of confidence too because you know as you walk through the wilderness you can start a fire anytime and that's the beginning of survival. Good luck. See you later. Well, we had quite a bit of fun with the fire bow and drill there and it's one of those special kind of techniques that you got to work at in order to make it work properly. The next one is also sometimes called a primitive fire making technique. It's uh, flint and steel, but it really isn't primitive. You see it takes steel to do it and steel is kind of modern. 
you wouldn't have seen any cavemen using this technique. But let's us take a good close look at it. I think you'll like what you see. Flint and steel. You got the word flint, you got the word steel. But all you really need is a hard rock and a household file if you want to get started with this one. Let me show you something. Those sparks you see flying off are the result of the heat that's built up when the piece of steel hits the hunk of rock. Something's going to break off and the energy is transferred to that something. If you can put a piece of tinder in the right spot, you can catch one of those little pieces of burning something and start a fire. So that's the principle of flint and steel. In the old days, people carried around a little piece of steel that looked something like this here. The striking edge is right across the front and it fits on your hand about like this. And the idea was to take a piece of flint like you see here and just strike it like so. And that would throw off the sparks they needed to start a fire. Now of course they'd carry these two pieces but they'd also carry a little bit of tinder with them. Sometimes it would be burnt uh, cotton, uh, a cotton ball if they had anything like that. Tinder like we got earlier from the juniper tree. There are a lot of different things that you could use for tinder but whatever it is, it needs to ignite easily, and when you carry it, you need to keep it dry. One of the best ways I've found to keep your tinder dry is these things here, film cans. I go out and pick up a couple of film cans whenever I can, and look, this one's stuffed full of cotton balls. These are real cotton balls. These are the kind that are 100% cotton. If you go down to a drugstore and purchase cotton balls to start a fire, be sure that they're 100% cotton balls and it says flammable on the container because there's some kinds they make that are not flammable and they can give you a lot of frustration. The other container here has another sort of tinder in it that you may never have thought of. This is steel wool. Steel wool ignites very very easily if you do it just the right way. When you're buying your steel wool be sure you get 4-0 steel wool. Some people call it 4 aught steel wool but it's got four little zeros and that's about as fine a steel wool as you can get. In any case, you just put them in your film cans, seal them up like that, and you've got plenty of tinder here to keep a fire going, or get a fire going. Another thing that I, I do is I have this little leather bag, and inside the leather bag is a little brass container that comes from the, the olden days. And when I open it up, you can see that it contains four little cotton balls. Take those out. Whoops. It's got a big hunk of steel wool. It contains a magnesium fire starting tool, a striker, a little steel striker, and a piece of flint. With this I can practice all of my techniques when I go out. And remember, like any primitive technique, it's important to practice it. If you don't practice it, you're not going to get it right and you sure as heck don't want to be depending on a skill that you don't actually own. Practice these things. Let's see how they're done. When you're using a steel and rock as you see here, what I've done is I put my piece of leather underneath the combination. Here's your steel wool. There's the rock. Normally I'd have the fire all set to go. Then I'd be able to take this little burning ember and drop it into the fire and make a fire. Now remember this too, when you start a fire this way, you're not necessarily going to get it on the first strike. So I may take a few whacks at this puppy before we actually get it going. Let's see what happens. There we go. Woo! It's hot, just like a fire. <laughs> okay, now we're going to try it out with a actual piece of flint and one of the old-fashioned strikers. Again, we're going to be using steel wool. Instead of striking with the steel, you can also do your striking with a piece of flint, like this.
If you're going to be learning how to start a fire with just a spark, probably the best way to, to start out is to, to find something that gives you a reliable spark. And two of the best things out there are these two tools right here. This is the magnesium fire starting tool, and this is the metal match. If you can learn how to use these things to start a fire, then you'll be able to move on to other techniques like flint and steel and finally to fire by friction. Let's take a look at these things. This here is the magnesium fire starting tool. The body of it is made out of magnesium and it's really quite soft. You can shave bits of it off. On the other side of it here is a little insert and this is a metal match. This thing here will give you sparks really easily. The idea behind this is to shave some of the magnesium off into a pile, which we'll demonstrate, and then after you've done that, strike a match into it, and that should ignite just about anything. Now the other tool is this thing here. This is just the metal match. This particular one is a Boy Scout version. You could pick these things up at Boy Scout counters all around the country. I think they cost about a dollar and a half. Doesn't look like much, but it sure does work. Look at this throws out a nice spark. With this thing here, you don't have any magnesium to catch your spark. What you're going to be depending on now is just some kind of a tinder that you've accumulated, something like the juniper bark or one of the other barks that you can use to catch a spark. So if you start with one of these, you can be sure to get a fire. It's a good tool. Get one of them, put them in your survival kit. Once again, my trusty hat comes into play. I've just taken the fire starting tool here and shaved off a pile of the uh, magnesium. You can see it right down in here, all these little filings. When you do this, be sure you shave off enough to cover an area about the size of a quarter. Most people who use these tools expect that if they just shave two or three little pieces somewhere, it's going to start a fire. It's not true. You need enough of this stuff to actually ignite and then catch your tinder. Some chemical supply houses will sell magnesium powder. That's what this is in this little container. This is 170 grit magnesium powder, and it's the same stuff that comes on the, ma the magnesium fire starting tool, except you don't have to grind it off. Now let me show you what you get with this stuff. It's, it is a powder inside. You can see here it's kind of lumpy right now. And this stuff makes a great fire starter. I'll just put a, a little bit of it down here on the, the fire starting table, and. Whenever you use this, you've got to keep in mind it's very, very dangerous, but it is an effective way of starting a fire. Now you can see I've got a little pile of the stuff down here. So we'll go ahead and do two things. One, I'm going to get it started, and two, I'm going to show you what happens when you add water, so you can kind of understand what might happen if you tried to do this in a rainstorm. You ready? So we've got a fire started. It burns at around 5,000 degrees. Now what we've got is just a little juniper bird's nest and the Boy Scout sparking tool. There's no magnesium in here, no hidden tricks, just these two things and my knife. Okay, now you can see that it didn't start right up. So what we're going to do just toss that little piece of cotton right in the middle. No magnesium. And see what happens this time. Well, looky there. We got a fire. This technique starts out with a glass bottle. So I'm going to take this glass bottle right here and I'm going to convert it into parts. There we go. That'll work just fine. For this experiment, I've selected a piece of that broken glass. Now, until this moment, you saw how you could start a fire with a metal match and a knife by just scraping it like so. But did you know that you didn't actually need a piece of metal? In fact, anything that's really sharp will throw a spark, even a piece of glass as you see there. So if you're out there in the woods and you only have your metal match and a piece of glass or a sharp rock, you can get a fire started with the metal match. This is a handy thing to know. 
I showed you how you can use cotton balls to get your fire started, but you can help the cotton balls to burn longer and hotter if you add a little bit of petroleum jelly like this here. And all you do is you open up the good old petroleum jelly and stick your cotton ball in it, something like this, and massage it down into the fibers of the cotton, like you see here. It's a gooey thing. But what you're going to want is a nice, well-saturated cotton ball. And that petroleum jelly is going to burn for quite a while, and it's going to burn nice and hot. Now be sure you massage it thoroughly into the fibers. And once you've done that, you're going to have something that burns a little bit like a torch. Let me show you here. Once you've got her put together like that, pull on the fibers and so they're sticking out a little bit as you did previously. Woo! Slippery. Now you can keep this thing in a film can or anything else. And then, when you're ready to start a fire, you put your cotton ball out, and you get her burning, like so. That Vaseline jelly will heat up nice and hot, and this thing will burn for quite a while. This gives you the opportunity to light wet wood, or uh, woods that are generally hard to get started. It also gives you an opportunity to get a fire started in a rainstorm, or uh, in cold weather, or in snow. But you can see that thing is burning good and hot, and it'll burn that way for quite a while. If you get your fire started, and uh, you no longer need the heat from the fireball, you can rescue it and put it out, put it back in your kit, and start another fire with it later. It's still good. Hot, but still good. Oh. <sighs> By the way, belly button lint is another source of tinder if you need to get a fire started. If you can get a little wad, something like this, set that stuff aside, and it, it reacts pretty much the same way as uh, as does your uh, cotton balls. There you go. It's good to have a prolific belly button. Actually, in fact, this is dryer lint. So if you're ever searching for a tinder and you have a dryer with you, but you don't have any cotton balls, just look for dryer lint. That'll do the job. And you can mix this with Vaseline just like the other. This is something else I keep in my survival kit. This is called trioxane. It's a fuel ration, believe it or not. And it's made by the, or for the military. And each of the little bars comes packaged like you see here in the characteristic OD green color. Now trioxane is kind of a, a dangerous material to breathe. If you're burning it, you want to be careful you don't uh, burn it in an enclosed area. It, it's, a, it's mildly toxic. But this is the stuff here. Now that little tablet will actually burn with a very, very hot flame for something like six to eight minutes. So you can cook coffee or you can use it as I do for starting a fire. And you don't need to use the entire tablet. You can split it into quarters and start your fire with just one quarter of the tablet. And that way you get four fires, each of which burns for a couple of minutes. Gets things going anyway. Oops, try that again. There we go. You see her. Yeah, she's burning all right. Now it burns with a very clear blue flame. I don't know if that's really visible to you, but uh, let me try to demonstrate here. You can see it's burning good and hot right in that area. <laughs> oh boy, this is the part I like. So we've got a trioxane fuel tablet here burning in water. This is also a great way to get a fire started uh, in a rainy environment. I would suggest that you keep one of these things with you. You know, I was watching an old movie the other day and I saw this guy stuck out in the wilderness and he pulls out his big old bowie knife and picks up a stone and takes that bowie knife and just slams it against the stone. Of course all the brush just burst into flames, something that I've never been able to do. I'd like to learn that trick. But the real thing that struck me about that was the fact that he used his knife. Let me tell you something. This stone was free. I found it laying around out here. This file cost me 50 cents. This knife cost $250. And you know what? For 250 bucks, I can't start a fire with it. It's the wrong kind of steel. This 50 cent file is the right kind of steel. It's a high carbon steel. It's real brittle and the pieces will break off. If my knife was made out of that kind of material, the knife would break off. So don't use your, your knife on these things to start a fire. Go out and get yourself a cheap file and a free rock. You'll have a lot more fun with it. Here's the trick I'm sure you've all been waiting for. This is, how do you start a fire 
with a flashlight. Well, this little flashlight here is the Mini Mag. You've probably seen it under other names as well, but it's a very common flashlight in the wilderness. A lot of people carry them because they're pretty rugged. So I have my little Mini Mag here, and I'm just going to unscrew the cap. This is the front reflector assembly, and you can see the bulb just glowing away there. Next thing I'm going to do is remove the bulb and put it into the reflector assembly. I'll set this aside so I don't lose that bulb. What else do you need to start the fire? Well, here's the trick. Steel wool. We're going to be using steel wool and two little pieces of wire from your snare wire kit. Let me show you how this is done. As you can see, I've placed a piece of snare wire in one of those little holes where the wire from the bulb used to go. Now I'm going to put one in the other hole and that will give us a place to make contact with the steel wool. I'm taking a little of that steel wool and kind of pulled it apart so that the filaments of the steel wool are spaced out. What we want to do now is touch it across these contacts and see if we can make a contact that will ignite some of the steel wool. Look at there. Fire. Ouch. It's hot too. If you have a flashlight like one of these things along with you, you've got two different ways of starting a fire. First of all, all you need to do is remove the reflector assembly. That's the part that holds the bulb, this here. Now down inside of this is a bulb, and if I was to remove the assembly at the back, we'd find out that if you were to stick a little piece of cotton in to the point where the bulb used to be, and then point it at the sun, the heat from the sun would be focused right on the place where that bulb was, and ouch, and cause that thing to catch on fire. Be careful, don't put your finger in the middle of one of these, it'll give you a nasty burn. Another thing, look at this. This has a package of batteries on it, and there's some power in this. You've also got the contacts right on top, so you can get right to them. Again, steel wool comes to the rescue. We'll just take our steel wool, just like we did with the other battery, and touch it across the contacts, and looky there, we have a fire. Put that out before I burn up. That's the trouble with teaching fire making. You get a lot of burns. Good luck with your electric fire starting techniques. These are a lot of fun, and they work really well. This next gadget is something that um, I'm not going to try to show you how to build because it takes a lot of precision work. But it is something that I saw first in Southeast Asia and recently I found this one on the internet. This thing is called a fire piston. Let me tell you a little bit about it. It works on the, principle that, the same principle that a diesel engine works on. This piece here is a chunk of wood with a little seal like a ring on it down here and it fits inside of this chunk of plastic. When you force this piston down into here, it compresses the air, and when it compresses it enough, it raises the temperature, and at that point, it ignites a little bit of tinder down at the tip of the piston itself. There's a little tiny hole right at the end of the piston, and that's where you're going to be putting your tinder. So the action when you're doing this is something like this. You insert the piston into it, and it's a real tight fit. This is why we're not going to try to show you, because I don't know how to do that and then you whack it like so. Now I don't have any tinder in here yet, so I thought what we'd do is we'd use some. This here is a type of fungus that uh, grows on trees, and there are several types of fungus that once they get dry, make a, a relatively uh, good tinder. And I'm just gonna take a little piece of this, sort of shove it down into the hole. Now I'm gonna have to break it off. It, it's, it's very difficult to see how much goes into it but it's a, a lot less than a P. There we go. I go. Whoops. Can't get my fingers to work that small. Get in there, you. Arr. Well, I'm trying. There we go. See if that works. Okay. Now I've got a little piece of, um, of tinder right in the end of the piston. Now what we're going to do is Put the piston together like so. I'll put it up and then I'll whack it good and hard and jerk it right out again and we'll see if we have a fire. There you go. We don't. Try it again. We don't. 
I'm going to trim a little bit of that off the end there, make it flat. It's kind of cold and wet out today, so that might have something to do with it. That. Hell of an idea, isn't it? Hmm. Okay, let's just try it again. That tiny little coal now needs to be picked out of there with a pin. Now, I don't think this is the most reliable way of starting a fire, but it's an example of how innovation can be used to start the fire. Innovation like that piece of glass to strike or a tiny little diesel engine to get a fire started. There's some more tricks. Let me show you those. We'll be starting this fire just as you saw. What I have here is a little bit of steel wool sitting in a bird's nest made out of uh, juniper bark. We'll strike that steel wool, get that burning. The juniper bark will light up. And after it's burning, we'll take some of this pine needle here, this nice dry pine needles, and we'll drop that on top of the fire. As soon as that ignites, we'll toss on some of these small sticks. They'll light easily. And on top of that, some larger sticks, and after that, larger sticks still. But that should give us a good sized blaze ready to accept some real firewood. One of the problems a lot of people have with fires is they'll get something burning and toss a log right on top of it. Naturally, it's going to go out. It takes some heat to get the bigger wood going. So we'll start with steel wool.
As we were making this tape, I, I began to realize that there were a couple of things that maybe I didn't make perfectly clear. In fact, there may be more than a couple, but there's a few that I spotted. One of those is with the, the fire bow. When you're using the fire bow, sometimes as you're working it back and forth, you'll discover that the string is going to start to loosen on you. And it just always seems to happen when you've got that heat coming up out of the drill. Here's how to handle it. Just stick your finger between the bow and the string itself. And when you do that, that'll tighten up the string. So just grip it in a fist, put the finger between the bow and the string, and you're ready to get back to work. Another thing is this. You may have noticed in some of the shots that I, I had a piece of leather sitting under my tinder. Well, that's really important, actually. I always carry a piece of leather like this with me. That way, when I get the fire started, when that delicate little spark falls into the tinder and we've got smoke and fire, I can pick it up like this, blow it into flame, and then transport it to wherever it is that I'm going to start my fire. Which brings me to another point. All these times I've gone to the mountains with, with students, I've watched these people work with their fire starting techniques. They get a spark, they get a flame, they're standing there looking at the flame, and then they don't have any place to put it. They're rushing around looking for little pieces of tinder and firewood and so forth. That's not the way to do it. When you're working with primitive techniques or techniques that start with just a spark, be sure that you've got your fire place area already set up. The stones are in place, the tinder has been collected and it's already set up. You've got everything ready to go. That way, when you get the flame, you can just set it down and put the fuel on top. You've got your fire. Saves you a lot of trouble. Something else that will help you, and I know I've said this before, be sure that you practice these techniques, particularly the fire bow. It takes a lot of time to find the right pieces of wood. You see, out here we used willow because it's probably one of the most common plants in the world. But wherever you are, there may be other plants that will work a lot better than the ones that I chose for demonstration. Search around. Find something that will work. Let me make one little pointer to you, too. We had a fellow make a fire bow one time, and he said, I'm going to use a shingle as my fire base. Went out and got some shingles. Got lots and lots of smoke, but he never got a fire. Later on, we discovered that the shingles had been treated with a fire retardant chemical, and it wouldn't burn. So you might want to look at that, too. After you've practiced with these techniques, and I mean practice, practice with flint and steel, practice with your metal match, and you've done all of your practicing at home, then you could take it to the wilderness with you. And when you get there, practice some more. Pretty soon you'll discover that when you've got the right setup, you can get a fire started in just a few seconds. You can probably do it faster than that fellow with the blue diamond match. It'll give you a lot of confidence, makes you feel good about yourself, and the people who don't know how to do this, they'll just sit there going, wow, that's great. Well, we hope you enjoyed Volume 1 of the Woods Master Series. And we hope that you'll join us in Volume 2, where we teach you the principles of outdoor survival shelter selection. Better yet, why don't you come and join us at the Hoods Woods Wilderness Education Center so we can introduce you to Hoods Woods.